I'm going to be talking about a very special character this morning, Elijah. I want to take you to a scripture, first and foremost. Please turn with me uh, to James, chapter 5. Because whenever we hear about James, we say, oh yeah, well, he, he, was, a, he was a mighty prophet. We can't ever measure up to him. And that's not quite true, not according to the Bible. Let's hear what it says in James 5, verse 17. Elijah was a human being with a nature as we have, with feelings, affections, and a constitution like ours. And he prayed earnestly for it not to rain, and no rain fell on the earth for three years and six months. Nowhere does it state in the Bible that God told him to say that. Let me take you to another scripture. Jot these down. Deuteronomy chapter 11. And we get a little bit of an inkling as to where Elijah, Elijah got the gumption to say what he said to Ahab. Verse 16 of chapter 11, Take heed to yourselves, lest your minds and hearts be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And the Lord's anger be kindled against you and he shall shut up the heavens so there will be no rain and the land will not yield its fruit and you shall perish quickly of the good land which the Lord gives you. That's the only area that I can find where it states that. So Elijah stands before King Ahab and he proclaims, he said, at my word. That's what he says. At my word, it's not going to rain for three years and six months. And at my word, it's going to rain again. What do you think of that, Chris? That's faith. That is faith. But he got it from somewhere. He really did. Let's just pray before I go any further. Father, we just want to honour you this morning. We want to honour your word. Father, you say in the Psalms that you elevate your word even above your name. So, Lord, I pray that we don't take it lightly, but we take it seriously. And, Lord, the scripture that I'm going to read in a minute, Lord, where Isaiah said... I'm going to look on those that tremble at my word. So, Father, I just pray that you would help me. Father, I pray help every hearer to hear with ears of faith, with hearts of faith and minds of faith. Lord, that they would make decisions to say, I'm going to believe God, I'm going to trust God, I'm going to obey God, I'm going to walk with God and let him lead me for the rest of my life. Help us all to do that for we ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So I want to read one more scripture from the Amplified. Uh, Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. And this is really exciting when you hear what's going to be brought out this morning as to how we can walk in authority and power and know that God stands behind his word to do it. Verse 1 and 2 of chapter 66 in the Amplified, Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house would you build for me? And what kind can be my resting place? For all these things my hand has made, and so all these things have come into being by and for me, in brackets, says the Lord. But this is the man to whom I will look on and have regard. He who is humble and of a broken or wounded spirit and who trembles at my word and reveres my commands. We've often heard the saying, the Bible is not a book of suggestions, it's a book of commands. 
you know, God doesn't suggest, well, you know, this would really be good for you if you, if, you, if, if you feel like doing it. That's not what he says. In 1 Kings 17, and we're not going to read it all, but I, I would encourage you to read it at home, 1 Kings 17 and also 1 Kings 18, being obedient to God's word makes Elijah public enemy number one. After making the pronouncement that there will be no dew or rain except by the word of Elijah. Nowhere does it state this, that, it, that God told him to say that, except what it says in what I just read from Deuteronomy 16 and 17. Now God tells him to go to the brook Cherith, a journey of 50 kilometers as public enemy number one. He's made the pronouncement to the king. It's not going to rain for three and a half hours, uh, three and a half years. And then God speaks to him after he does that. And this is what God says to him. Go to the brook Cherith as public enemy number one. And King Ahab calls Elijah the troubler of Israel. He says, you just trouble. That'd be a nice moniker to have on. You just, you just trouble me. He's the king, and this one prophet troubles him. And there is Elijah to be fed by ravens, unclean birds, by the way, morning and night, and drinking from the brook Cherith for one year, according to the chronological Bible. For one year he was there, and he was fed by the ravens, bread, and meat for breakfast and at night time for 365 days. I tell Suze, I can eat the same food every day and I'm happy with it. Most people are not happy with the same food every day. When God puts you in a place of confinement, he has a very, very good reason for it. Please hear me. And it's not just to keep you safe. It is also a time of preparing you for that which he has in store for your destiny. And you, I'm going to say some things that really put that into context. I wonder what Elijah was feeling in that total isolation. Just him and God for 365 days. He sleeps wakes up, gets a drink of water out of the creek and this dirty bird flies in and he's got bread and he's got meat. Drops it right where he's at, bird leaves for the rest of the day, probably 10, 12 hours, another bird comes in. Bit of meat, bit of bread, I wonder what he thought of his diet. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't comment on it, but a bit boring maybe? I think so. Bread and meat for breakfast and for dinner. Elijah has been preparing himself for ministry. He has. Studying the word from Deuteronomy 11 that I read out before, that was the basis for the prophetic word that he spoke. He learned lots about prayer. James makes that very clear. He is ready to launch his ministry and God says, go hide yourself. He's already done it. He stood before the king and he said, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. There's not going to be any dew on the ground for three and a half years except at my word. No sooner does he go out there and God says, go hide yourself at the brook Cherith. No people to minister to. No platform. No opportunity to pursue his calling. Elijah is already, he's already shown himself to be ready by standing before the king. And then God's word comes to him, go hide yourself. Yeah. 
And you will find quite a bit of that in Scripture. God hid Joseph in a prison before he came to the palace for years. They say approximately 14 years. For when his brothers put him in the pit, got him out of the pit, sold him to a bunch of Ishmaelites, and he finished up in Egypt, went to Pharaoh's house, God blessed, went to Potiphar's, uh, Potiphar's house, God blessed the house because of him. And then the what's name? Then he, the Potiphar's wife thought, well, he's a good looking sort. I wouldn't mind spending some time with him. And he, what's name? He says, look, he said, your master has put everything in my hand. He doesn't even count anything. He trusts me to that extent. But he said, you're his wife. He said, that's a no-go area. And finally, she grabs hold of his coat. He runs out of the room. And she says, he tried to hanky-panky with me. And he's put in prison. In prison, he, he gets exactly the same treatment. The prison warden trusts him. God blesses him in everything that he does. He puts everything under his control. A couple of people from, from Pharaoh's uh, palace come in there, the baker and the, and, and the wine, the cupbearer, and finally they say, we had a dream. And, and, and he says, you know, I, I think I can interpret that by God's grace. So he interprets the dream, the first one, he interprets it really good, and he likes what he hears, and the second one does exactly the same thing. Well, he said, you're going to be restored to your position. He said, you're going to have your head taken off, and you're going to be hanged on a tree. That wasn't so good, but he says to the first one, he said, remember me when you go back into Pharaoh's palace. He said, because I've done nothing wrong. For two years, nothing is remembered until Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh has a dream. Nobody can interpret a dream. First he sees cows coming out of the river, fat ones. Then he sees gaunt cows coming out of the river. The gaunt ones eat the fat ones, but they don't look any better than what they did before. And then he sees stalks growing, Nice fat ones, full of grain, and he sees blighted ones, you know. And he's got no idea what it means. He said, I need somebody to explain me to me what, what all this means, what this dream means. And that's all of a sudden when the cupbearer says, ah, I remember I said that I would say something to Pharaoh for two years. This I haven't done any of this stuff, and... I think I'd better do it. So he said, I met somebody in prison. He said, they, he prophesied, sorry, he interpreted the dreams of my dream and the baker's dream, and he said he was spot on. Well, he says, bring him out, and they shower him, and they clothe him, and they, they, he has a shave, and he comes in. He said, my God is able to tell your dream. And he interprets the dream for Pharaoh. And he said, you're going to have seven years of plenty. He said, you're going to have seven years of terrible drought. Nothing's going to grow. And you need somebody very wise to orchestrate all that and put all that together. And they all look at him and they think, well, there's no, nobody better than you. And you're going to be the man. And Pharaoh says, you're going to be in control of everything except, he said, my authority is going to be the ultimate authority. But apart from that, you run everything. And that's exactly what happens. He hid Moses in the desert for 40 years, a third of his life. Can you imagine? You're all charged up for ministry, and God says, not yet. George Mueller, that did all the, what's name, the, uh, the children houses in, uh, in, in the UK. He desperately wanted to go and preach. Apparently, he never went to preach worldwide until he was nearly 80 years old. 
And yet when he went, he filled stadiums all over the place, chock-a-block full, because he had something to say, didn't he? After what he did, by faith, never asked anybody for anything. God hid David in the mountains, running in and out of caves from Saul before he was ever recognized as a king, even though he'd been anointed as a king. In the New Testament, we find Paul for three years in Arabia after his conversion, before he became a, a missionary, that everybody was, oh yeah, he's the real deal. And here God hides Elijah at Cherith before his great life's contribution at Carmel. Don't count it strange if God hides you, and here is the principle. When God chooses to hide you for a time, he is preparing you for a greater purpose. God led him to Cherith, and then God led him out of Cherith. And as a believer, you can have absolute confidence through the entire life that God is leading you if you are submitted to him. The moment you are submitted to him, you can bet your bottom dollar and there's no fear of contradiction. God is going to lead you into your destiny. He's going to do it. Nothing can stop him, actually. The Lord is your shepherd, and he is your shepherd even at Cherith, being fed meat by ravens and drinking from a creek. Can't get anything more basic than that, can you? The Holy Spirit leads us one step at a time as you take a step of obedience. Then God will show you what to do next. And here's some scriptures. Verse 1 of 1 Kings 17 says, tells us about Elijah, the step of faith and obedience going to stand before the king, who's got the power of life and death in his hand, by the way. And then God will show you what to do next. In verse 2 of 1 Kings 17, God tells him what to do next. Just jot those scriptures down, 1 and 2. Verse 1 tells us about Elijah, step of faith and obedience. Then verse 2, God tells him what to do next. Verse 5 of the same chapter tells about Elijah's obedience. Elijah went and did according to the word of the Lord. Then in verse 8, God tells him what to do next. So many times people say, well... I don't know what to do. Well, have you done what God just told you to do before? If you do that, he will tell you the next step. Go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, a place of refinement, according to the, to the dictionary, Strong's and Corns, I mean, a place of purification with fire. This is the territory that Jezebel came from, according to 1 Kings 16, 31. There's a widow. She's going to provide for him. And what does he say to the widow when he sees her? Just give me a little bit of water. And by the way, while you get a little bit of water, just bake a small cake for me and bring that to me first. She in return says... Listen, I'm gathering a couple of little sticks. In the Amplified, it says two sticks, a few sticks in the, in the King James. And I've got a little bit of oil and a little bit of meal. I'm going to bake a cake. We're going to eat it, me and my son, and then we're going to die. And what, he doesn't respond to that. He said, bring me a bit of bread first. Boy, I tell you what, she is, and then he prophesies. He said, oil's not going to run out, meal's not going to run out until. 
two years or two and a half years, between two and two and a half years he's there. And they're eating from that food all the time. And what happens in that time? In, in that time, the child dies, gets sick, and there's no more breath in him. That's what the King James says. So the lady comes back to the prophet and says, have you come to remind me of the sin that I committed by killing my child? Gee, that's, that's pretty rough, isn't it? He doesn't even answer her. He says, just bring me the child. He doesn't, he doesn't answer, bring me the child. So he brings the child and he repeats to God what the woman said to him. O oh Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and he comes back and he brings the child back to her alive. She says something really, really interesting at this time. Please turn with me to 1 Kings 17. How would you feel in your pantry, all you've got is a little bit of meal, and you've got a little bit of oil. And every morning you take a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil and you bake some bread for the day for her, for the son, and for Elijah. And you, 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 you can't get rid of the oil, can't get rid of the meal. It just stays there. It reconstitutes what, what, whatever you call it. I don't know what you'd call it, but it, they... For two and a half years. You think, she would think that, oh, this man is a mighty prophet of God, whatever he says, this is the real deal. She doesn't say anything about that at all. Listen to what she says in the last verse of chapter 17. He just said, and Elijah, see, 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 your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth is the truth. What about the meal and the oil for two and a half years? She doesn't say anything about that, but when the son is given back to her, she says, now I know that the word in your mouth is truth. Wow. And then a few more days go past. Doesn't say how many. But God says, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Obedience. Big, big deal. A lot of people say, oh yeah, that's all the Old Testament. Well, when I get to the end, you're going to hear some from the New Testament and it doesn't make any difference at all. And on the way, he meets Obadiah, who is a trusted servant to Ahab, but most of all, a servant of God. He feared the Lord greatly. That's what the Bible says. Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord. How many, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say but Obadiah hides a hundred prophets in two caves and feeds them bread and water in groups of 50. Obadiah is also one of the minor prophets who wrote the book of Obadiah, just 21 verses. Not a big book, but when you get to heaven, he's going to ask you that question, did you read my book? Better read it so you can say yes. Elijah meets him and says, go tell your master Elijah is here. And a discussion arises because Obadiah says, 
oh, mighty man of God, you know. He said, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to go and meet, meet the king. I'm going to say, Elijah's going to meet you, and the Spirit's going to take you off somewhere. And he says, you're not going to be there anymore, and the king's going to kill me. That's why I want you to read 1 Kings 18, because it's all in there. But for the sake of time, we won't read it all. And Elijah really has to speak to him. He says, I will present myself to Ahab. And based on the word of Elijah to Obadiah, he goes, okay. So now the challenge arises. He says, there's 850 prophets, false prophets, and the challenge that Elijah poses to the king and to the people, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. Two altars are going to be set up with wood and sacrifices on the altar, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the preparation takes place, and because the prophets of Baal are many, Elijah says, you go first, come on, have a go. So 850 of them start dancing around the altar. And after they've been dancing for quite a while, he starts to mock them. That's what the Bible says, he mocked them. In some of the translations, he says, maybe he's gone to the toilet, shout a little bit louder. You know, or in other translations, he says, He's probably meditating. You need to really make a lot of noise to make sure that he's, uh, that he's going to be able to hear you. And in the finish, they start cutting themselves with lances and blood's dripping out of their bodies while they're dancing around the altar and absolutely nothing happens. And Elijah said, okay, you've had your go. Now it's my turn. What does he do? He restores the altar that was broken down, the Bible says. He gets 12 stones, cuts the bull in pieces, puts it on top, puts wood. And then he said, I want you to, what's the name, throw some water on it. About 13 and a quarter litres, apparently, what I was able to work out. And he said, do it again. And he said, do it again. Three times, about 40 litres of water is poured out over the whole stone's offering. There was a bit of a gutter around it as well. And then he says, God in heaven, I, these are my words, show these people your power. Fire comes down from heaven and listen to what the Bible says. The wood is burnt. The bull on the altar is burnt. The stones are burnt. The dust is burnt. And the water, there's absolutely nothing left. And all the people jump up and they say, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I bet they did. Can you imagine? Fire falling down from heaven. There's an altar here. Twelve rocks, wood, bull, water. Fire falls down from heaven. All of a sudden, nothing. No dust, no stones, no bull, no wood, no water. Wouldn't your eyes come out like stalks? I reckon most likely they would. All the people cry out, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Elijah says, seize the false prophets, 850 of them, and he executes them. I, I, I look at that piece and I go, by himself? By himself? 
straight after that, he says to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of an abundance of rain. Nobody's heard anything except Elijah. But he's hearing and seeing because he's obedient to God and God tells him the next step all the time. Next step, next step, next step. He goes to the top of the mountain, bows down with his head between his knees and says to a servant, go look towards the sea and he comes back, he said, nothing. He says, go again. Nothing. Well, go again. Nothing. Well, go again. Nothing. Well, go again. Nothing. That's four times. Go again. Nothing. Go again. Nothing. Ah, a cloud the size of a man's hand. Come on. That's pretty small. What does he say? Ahab, go before the rain stops you. And what does the Bible say? Elijah girds up his loins and outruns Ahab's chariot 32 kilometers. It's not quite a long distance, which is 42, but it's a long way. After he's been doing all this stuff and he probably had this mantle right down to his, what's that, to his feet somewhere, he girds it up to about here and he's going for it. No, he's not catching me. He's going for it. I read this and I go, in the power of the Lord, anything is possible. And you say, come on, does that really happen? Well, Elisha said to Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army, he said, just go to one of our rivers, and he says, dip in it seven times. And he gets really mad. He says, in our country, he said, we've got rivers that are much better than that. But there's a Jewish girl that's been taken captive. She said, if the master had been told to do something hard, he would have done it. Why not do something simple? Once, leprosy. Twice, leprosy. Three times, leprosy. Four times, leprosy. Five times, leprosy. I'm sick of this. No, you haven't gone to seven yet. Six times, leprosy. Seven times, totally clean. We really need to follow what the Lord is telling us to do. Why? We all want to see results. Come on. Is that right? We all want to see results? We do. Well, we're going to have to do it his way. It doesn't happen any other way. And this is what I say. Lord, do it again. Bring us to the place where we will do, as you say, every step of the way, trembling at your word of the Lord and, re and revering your commands. You know that love and obedience go hand in hand. John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, this is Jesus speaking, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. The reverse is also true. He who has my commands and do, does not keep them doesn't love me. We can't get away from that truth. We either do what he tells us to do or we won't do what he tells us to do. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. That's what Jesus promises either by word or deed is the word manifest.
as we go into 2024, I want to see what God wants us to see. I don't want to see what I want to see. I want to see what the Lord Jesus Christ has in store for us. He says, greater works than these you will do because I go to the Father. That's what he promises. But it's based on walking by the Holy Spirit because Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit and he will show you of things to come. He will start showing us things that we haven't seen yet. And I want to see that. I want to see that in the street. I want to see that in the church. I want to see that in the school. I want to see that in the media. I want to see all those things that Jesus Christ said, you're going to do greater things. Jesus walked by himself, no television, no nothing, and everybody flocked to him. And then he says, you're going to do greater things. I want to see those greater things. And I pray that you want to see those greater things as well. Can we pray? Father, we want to thank you. Lord, as we have such clear instruction in your word, Lord, that as you speak to us and we are obedient, you'll show us the next step. As we are obedient, you'll show us the next step. As we are obedient, you'll show us the next step. And Lord, we live in this time where the Holy Spirit indwells us that will show us the things to come, that will show us what to say to the right person at the right time, in the right place. Help us to do that, Lord, led by your Holy Spirit, and that we do that in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we've been left down here for a purpose. Lord, to be light and to be salt. Lord, to stop this world from doing its own thing. And Lord, more and more establish the kingdom of God on the earth. Help us to do that in every way and with every quality that you have imparted into our being that we would use those qualities for your glory and for your honour, Lord Jesus, for we ask it in your precious name. Amen.